Welcome to Frontline News from the University of Maryland School of Medicine News Center. I'm Larry Roberts. Coming up, genomic brain mapping could open the door to new treatments for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. But first, the FDA and CDC have approved the Pfizer COVID vaccine for children aged 5 to 11. Despite the recommendation, some parents are reluctant to get their children vaccinated. This week, I spoke with Dr. Karen Kotloff, Dr. Jim Campbell, and Dr. Milagritos Tapia, all pediatricians and vaccinologists at the Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health. Dr. Kotloff, now that the vaccine is available to some 28 million children, what do parents need to consider? The message that I think is important for them to consider is that although children tend to tolerate COVID much better than adults do, it still is a medical problem for children. Um, there's evidence that nearly 40% of children in this age group have been infected with COVID in this country. There have been more than 8,000 hospitalizations in this age group, and about 100 children have died. About a third of children who are hospitalized end up in an ICU. So it's not a trivial disease um, for children. And um, I think to protect children themselves, there's a strong argument uh, for wanting to get this vaccine. It really is having a public health impact similar to influenza. And that's something to take very seriously. Dr. Campbell, what would you say to a parent who is on the fence about getting a COVID vaccination for their child? We have a vaccine that is essentially 100% effective against death and intensive care unit, you know, the, the bad outcomes of COVID. So you have to put that into context. This is, COVID is now for children, the eighth leading cause, all cause of death in children and the number one infectious, like single pathogen infectious disease cause in children over these last two years. So yes, it's not as severe as in elderly or adults with uh, other medical problems, but it is, unfortunately, can be very severe in children. And it's not only children who have pre-existing problems. Dr. Tapia is so confident in the vaccines, her sons participated in a COVID vaccination trial at the CVD. She says vaccines will help protect vulnerable people from infection and keep kids in school, allowing a faster return to normal. I mean, I'm a parent. I have um, children in school now, and one of their, their classes had to completely shut down and is in quarantine and had to go to fully virtual learning because there were too many cases in that class in that year, in that grade year. And so these are things that can continue to happen in the community as children, if children are not vaccinated. And so really, again, I think from my view as a parent and as a scientist, um, the data are there supporting the safety and efficacy of these vaccines. And it's the best thing that we can do to get our children back to their normal, usual lives at school and interacting with their peers in safe and meaningful ways, especially as the holiday season approaches. So how should parents go about getting a COVID vaccine for their child? You can look it up on the Maryland website, on the government website, where vaccine is available in pharmacies, in these mass vaccination places, in your pediatrician's offices. Um, but I, I think the best place to start is with what we call your medical home. And that is with your, you know, the most, the person you trust the most caring for your kids. And that's your pediatrician or your family practitioner or your nurse practitioner. In our discovery segment, a new frontier in medicine lies at the intersection of genomic and brain science, where researchers are beginning to understand the nature of psychiatric and neurodegenerative diseases, as well as substance abuse disorders. At the Institute of Genome Sciences, researchers are using new technologies to create a genetic map of cell types within the brain. Over the long term, we definitely hope to discover novel mechanisms that will lead to new therapies. Um, we tackle that approach through two strategies. One strategy is starting from, from people's genetics, so the heritable components as to why some of these diseases run in families. And we do that primarily by sequencing people's genomes and the genomes of their families to identify unique mutations 
Um, and then we use stem cells and animal models to study the effects of those mutations on the brain. Another strategy focuses on cell types in the brain and how those cells change in the presence of disorders like Huntington's disease and Alzheimer's disease. This mapping is accomplished by using a cutting-edge technology called single-cell genomics. Single-cell genomics is a remarkable new technology by which it is possible to take thousands of cells from a particular part of the brain and sequence all of the genes that are expressed in each of those cells separately so that we can build up maps for the genes expressed in tens or hundreds or even millions of cells from, from the brain and understand all of the diversity of cell types and how they change. The data is being collected, analyzed, and stored by the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network, a national consortium that publishes and shares the information with scientists around the world. The consortium's first publications in the Journal of Nature profiled cell types in the primary motor cortex, the part of the brain that controls movement. The motor cortex uh, is, is a brain region that changes um, and degenerates in diseases like Alzheimer's disease, ALS, or Huntington's disease. Yet we really still don't have an understanding of why some cell types are more vulnerable in those diseases than others. And mapping all of the individual cell types is an important first step. A step that one day may lead to new treatments. Our ability to do this work started with seed funding from, from the Dean of the School of Medicine. And bringing these technologies here, we really are indebted to that initial support. And it's been great to see how, how that's expanded and, and enabled us to do this kind of work. And that's Frontline News. Thanks for joining us. I'm Larry Roberts. We'll see you again in two weeks.